Welcome to KBA Vendor Viewpoint. This is Selena Parrish, KBA Director of Membership Products and Services. Today we are featuring KBA endorsed in contracts. We have had in contracts endorsed for over 12 years and it's been a tremendous relationship. We are pleased to have with us Rafael De Leon with In Contracts. Rafael is Senior Vice President, Industry Engagement. And also today we have KBA member Chip Clements, Chief Technology Officer with Fork Bank in Lexington. Thank you both so much for being on today's podcast. Rafael, let's kick it off. KBA and our members have enjoyed having you with us, and you've spoke at several of our KBA functions. Please tell our audience about your role with in contracts. Well, thank you, Selena. I appreciate being here today. Um, so um, I think one of the things that really makes me effective with bankers is I have a passion for community banks and what bankers are doing. And that really comes from a long history. Uh, I, I think you've heard me talk about it. I've been in banking my whole life. My father was a community banker. So I was running around the bank as a kid uh, and really enjoyed my time at the bank to the point I started working at the bank when I was in high school. And I'll date myself. And that was back in 1980 and 81 uh, when I started working at the bank and filing checks manually and working in the back office. And I really enjoyed banking. And when I told my dad and the CEO, I was really interested in going into banking and pursuing it as a career. They said, go work for the OCC for three to five years. Uh, and I did. Although that three to five years turned into 32 years um, mm. because of a lot of the changes that we were seeing in the industry. But I felt like I could do a lot of good and I could understand what bankers were going through, but also approach it very differently from a regulatory side. So having 32 years of experience in examining banks in, in uh, Austin, Texas, and out of Chicago, Illinois, of every size bank, I permit... I pretty much stayed focused on community bank. I've done some works in the large banks, but really the, the success and survival of the community banking industry is just really important to me. Uh, and that's where the, that passion really comes from. So in addition to after retiring uh, today from the federal government and working with the OCC, I came to work for End Contracts. Uh, and in my position, I do a lot of outreach and engagement, speaking, you know, doing podcasts and other events like this, speaking at your functions, uh, both on uh, I, uh, this, not only the state level, but a national level as well. And I really got used to doing this. I'm a teacher at heart. Um, and um, there was a brief segue into teaching uh, before I worked for the OCC. But through the OCC, I did a lot of training. And one of the trainings that I did for over 15 years was a bank director workshop. So I got used to hearing from uh, bankers and directors about their issues and challenges that they were having on the regulatory side, but just in terms of banking and what, what does resilience and success look like for tomorrow. Uh, so I get to bring a lot of that with me into the job I'm doing here at End Contracts. But I think the other piece that also fell into place three years ago is I'm uh, on the board of directors of a bank uh, in Fairfax, Virginia. I live in Washington, D.C. And so it's a $2 billion bank. So I've got the perspective of each of those viewpoints, the, the examiner, uh, the banker, and also now as a board member and how all those come together and what are the kind of uh, tensions and challenges there are, especially in the macroeconomic environment that we've seen over the past year. Definitely. Your expertise is just uh, amazing to hear about, Raphael. Thank you so much for sharing. And and Chip, tell us about Fork Bank and all the work that In Contracts is doing for you. How how long have you all used uh, In Contract services? First of all, thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. Um, we have um, been using In Contracts since 2017. We use multiple modules of theirs, including In Vendor, In Continuity, In Risk, and In Findings. And it's been a tremendous partnership um, since day one. So, Chip, you know, you're using you've been using these since 2017. Um, what was the program? What was the solution that you started with first or maybe even a group of them? Yes, we originally started with in vendor and in continuity because we needed to strengthen our vendor management process as well as our business continuity and disaster recovery um, testing as well as process procedures, tracking, and so forth like that. So those were really the first two um, that we focused in on. About a year and a half, two years later, 
we started to implement in risk and, and then maybe about four f- years later was in findings. We really um, started to utilize um, because of a lot of new enhancements within in findings. Um, well, you've, you've got a lot of core sets of, you know, uh, our features in terms of this. So let's go back to vendor management. Uh, when you implemented that within your bank, and could you actually just give uh, the audience a, a perspective on the size of the bank that you're working at and how long you've been there? Yes. Uh, Fork Bank is a community bank headquartered in Lexington, Kentucky. We have branches throughout Kentucky as well as um, Cincinnati. We have 22 banking centers, three loan production offices. And I have been with Fork for roughly about eight and a half years now. Great. So you have uh, quite a bit of experience still in the industry with other things that you've done outside of bank. But uh, let's kind of focus on what you've done with Fork Bank. So tell me about what the process looked like, how you came to the decision on on, uh, reaching out to end contracts and using the solution. And how did that help, especially with vendor management? And then we'll move into business continuity planning. Sure. Once we decided that, well, once I took over the vendor management, business continuity areas, um, which report to our information security officer. Um, We needed to really enhance and be able to clearly document and report in a timely fashion as much information uh, regarding our vendors as humanly possible. If you notice, I said that business continuity and vendor management both report to our information security officer. And most banks, ISO is a full-time job already. Um, in our bank, because of our size, um, they all report to the ISO, who then reports to me. So we needed a system that allowed us to be somewhat hands off. We need to be able to kind of set and forget and allow the system and the dashboard and the reporting to tell us what is needed versus us tracking things on, say, a glorified spreadsheet, which is what we were doing prior. So we looked at several vendors. Um, we ultimately decided on uh, in cotton or excuse me, in vendor. And it's been a a great decision all along. We receive constant compliments from our third-party auditors regarding our vendor management process and how we track it and the level of detail and automation that's used too. The implementation of it um, was actually um, a very clean, I don't want to say easy process because there's a lot of information that you do need to enter into the system to initially set it up and configure it. But in contracts was there the whole, through the whole process, um, we had multiple calls. The implementation was, uh, I want to say relatively painless, to be honest with you. It was time consuming because of the detail that is required, but that is a one-time configuration. After that, it pretty much runs itself unless you're adding or deleting a vendor. So you you bring up some really good points there, because um, I think often the challenge that community bankers face is finding the time and, you know, and their schedule to try to implement a new product or solution. Um, But I think, again, you touched on some of the key points that I've noticed here within contracts is that we can get people typically on it, you know, up and running within 90 days after they've purchased a solution. Now that, you know, there's a give and take in that, but typically that's a really good average to getting something implemented. And from when you implemented back in 2017, I know that we've continued to enhance and refine our processes. And so I like to talk about our processes in the sense that, We can get a bank up and running from where their existing system looked like, but now within the end vendor product to help you utilize it better. So you kind of know, you know, your processes, your systems and how that was going to conform with that. Uh, And then we have specialists that can help the bank in setting it up. And I don't think we had it to that extent in 2017. I didn't come to end contracts until 2021. But I know that we just kept developing how we were doing this and how we were partnering with banks to really address that problem. Uh, Where do you find the time to basically, or how do you change the tires on a moving vehicle? Uh, Because banking doesn't really stop for anyone um, and most importantly for your community. So um, your example is right on with what we're seeing. And I, I think one of the other value added services that end contracts brings, and and I'll have you speak to this. And you were talking about end contracts with you along the way. 
we provide knowledge as a service. So in addition to like the subject matter expertise and knowledge that I bring, we've got a number of other people uh, that are working on the staff that really understand banking. And so it's not just a solution that we're selling. And one of the things that I really take pride in working in contracts because it is a team effort. We've got a lot of people that really understand banking, have been you know, um, compliance and risk officers, We've had regulatory attorneys. We have, like myself, former regulators. So we've got a great knowledge pool that we can also share with our uh, with our bankers as well. So tell us a little bit more about that implementation as you saw with each of the products. How did end contracts help you? Well, on the initial implementation, you all were there uh, providing constant support best practices was very important because you all knew your system much better than we did at that time. So we needed you all to help us and discuss what the system can really do. What are other banks doing with it? How would you recommend that we utilize it? And then we had to kind of dovetail that together with our policies and procedures that we had written out. And then throughout this process though, what was, and this is an interesting point that I do want to make because it is a source of contention with me, with other vendors. And that is after the implementation period, if I have a new manager who maybe needs some additional training on in continuity or in vendor and risk or some module, or let's say the regulatory environment is changing, we want to start tracking, say, fourth party vendor management. We want to focus in on that area or artificial intelligence as something that we've recently started to focus in with our vendors. What is great about in contracts that we do not see with most, I would say 98% of our other vendors is that you all will help us. You'll get on a call with us. We can discuss it with you. We'll screen share. We'll give you our thoughts. You'll give us your thoughts. And we can come to a resolution and conclusion on how best to implement or configure or change the system to meet say this new dynamic or new process or new procedure that we've implemented. The reason I say this is a source of contention for me is I oversee all of the technology and all the applications within Fork Bank, plus all the IT infrastructure. I also have cybersecurity, vendor management, business continuity, change management, and a multitude of other things. One of the things that is most frustrating for me in my job is when I go to a vendor and I ask for their help on to use or configure your their system and i get back yes we can do that but it would be a project management fee of a thousand dollars you do not hear that within co contracts you get nothing but support you will get it quickly um, and they will take the time and 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 i'm i know i sound kind of like a you know a groupie here but that's i'm just being very honest because i oversee over 100 systems and we don't see this with our other vendors. We don't see the level of support. We don't see the time taken to help. We don't see um, almost a, a, an inquisitive desire on your all's part to learn how we do business. Because throughout the years, we've had these conversations about a particular configuration. And it's interesting to hear a developer on, from in contracts maybe say something like, well, we never thought about doing that ourselves. That's a great point. We need to communicate that out. We need to talk about that internally. So it's it's really kind of a partnership. It's a give and take. It's a discussion. And it's a lot of support that is free. That is the key there. It's, and that's ultimately where I'm going with this kind of rambling on here is that it's free. Yeah. Um, so. No, I, I think, again, it's not even rambling because you're really getting to the salient points that we get from bankers. And I, I'm glad that you're able to address it from your side and how it's impacted you. Um, I, I think, again, that gets back to that knowledge as a service. We really want to understand. But I would say that is really a key point in terms of uh, our uh, developers or any of our people that are sitting on the phone with a banker and trying to help them out is we all learn more through that process. And, you know, given the fact that we have over 4,000 customers that have at least one or more of our products, we're getting a lot of feedback and being able to, you know, uh, and implement it. Uh, just recently, there was a uh, banker who had used end contracts for a while and then um, was, you know, moved to a different product for three, four years, and then came back to end contracts. And I just heard them say the other day when several of us were at dinner, uh, other bankers were like, you know, 
we asked for, we were looking for some product features within uh, NVendor. And at the time, end contracts didn't have it. But by the time we came back, and that's why we came back as a customer, they'd addressed everything that uh, the bank was asking or we had end contracts had. So it gets to your point and, and one that's actually more modern, you know, or more relevant even today. Um, as we're talking about end vendor, how has that helped you in terms of your examinations with the regulators? I know that's also a key point of contention and it challenges with many bankers. How have you seen it helping? It's helped a tremendous amount, to be honest with you. Uh, we can, not only is there reporting, but there's also dashboards um, that we utilize on a daily basis. And we'll sometimes we'll screenshot those dashboards for regulators to show them certain aspects of the system. Um, to be honest with you, we've also, with our third party auditors, as well as some of our regulators, we have actually sat down with them and done a screen share and walked through the in-contract system with a third party auditor and show them what we were doing and how we were doing it and why we were doing it. And they would ask questions and we had great dialogue and they... A lot of times they would ask us questions about your system. Can it do this? What have you thought about doing it this way? And so it became this collaborative, what was a quote, a scary audit or, you know, you know, right. it turned into a very collaborative affair with um, our outside examiners. And, and that's hard to do when you're dealing with just a spreadsheet, uh, kind of flat, you know, to be able to explain it here, they can actually see how it's working and the interconnectedness. And so while I'm talking about interconnectedness, you also have one of our companion products that I think works extremely well with uh, InVendor, and I'd like to have you talk about it, is the business continuity planning and continuity. How has that worked uh, and, and how have you seen the benefits of that between those two programs? That's yeah, a good point. One thing about uh, in contracts is that the modules connect together. So if I put a vendor in, in vendor, I can jump over to in continuity and let's say I'm doing, um, uh, I'm going to record an incident that occurred, say an outage. So my vendor, let's say is, let's just say it's AT&T internet is my vendor that's in the in vendor system. But we have an AT&T outage and I'm going to record that in our in continuity business continuity DR system as an incident that I want to track and do a postmortem on. And so we can have discussions on um, what our action items were and, and how we handled it, what went right, went wrong. That vendor AT&T has already been pulled over into in continuity through the connectivity of the modules. So I don't have to go into incontinuity and rekey AT&T as a vendor with an address and phone number and all the information. It's all in there already. I just select them, then select there's been an incident, and then I can document the incident. So that interconnection between the systems is phenomenal. Uh, it saves a lot of rekeying. It saves a lot of time. Again, it, you know, I have one person who's the main administrator over you know, three different um, aspects of the bank, and we don't have time to rekey information. Mm -hmm. No, I think, again, that is typically challenging. And that's one of the other key facets of our solutions and programs. And you and I touched on this the other day, uh, the efficiency of which it helps. And have you been able to notice those efficiencies within your institutions or even be able to try to quantify them? Oh, we see it all the time. Um, quantifying it, no, it's very hard. Um, but I, what I can do is I can look at how much reporting, how much tracking, how much information is exchanged. And between from a business continuity perspective, from a vendor perspective, from a risk management perspective, and from an um, in findings perspective, and see that I have one person doing that full time. Mm -hmm. And they are able, with other people's help too, it's not solely their job, but they administer, manage the process, maintain the process. Um, we do use management's help to gather documents or um, you know, do some risk uh, reviews with her in conjunction with her. Um, she walks them through the questions and so forth like that. But we have one person who is able to handle this in an effective means. Um, and and to be honest with you, to stay current with it, that is the key. A lot of times we can 
say we're doing something, but are we really doing it? And are we doing it the way that policy or procedure says? Right. You know, with the efficiencies that we get from the various in contracts modules, if we say we're going to review a vendor every six months, we are reviewing a vendor every six months. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think those are great examples, and it, it's helpful to know that you notice that in terms of what you're able to keep up with and the volume of work you're able to keep up with, with, uh, you know, minimal staff. Uh, and I think that is one of those other key challenges that, that most community bankers are facing is, you know, their, the earnings uh, pressures that most banks are facing. There's, you know, compression on the net interest margin, uh, you know, salaries and other things that continue to go up. And I know at a lot of banks there, most people are trying to do more with less to try to drive that efficiency. Uh, and you've seen uh, and kind of providing us a testimonial of how it works uh, with uh, with uh, for your institution. The the next program that I'd like to talk about is um, um, N risk and and how you're using N risk. Sure, N risk is an interesting module. Um, it's actually probably my favorite one to be honest with you. Um, basically. In risk allows us to track various risks that the bank um, wants to track. We don't track every single risk under the sun. It would you know, take a team of people, but we track all of the major risks and then we can apply mitigating controls to them. And then we can look at that particular risk from a financial perspective, financial impact to the bank perspective or from a non-financial um, aspect. So, I really kind of want to focus in on that financial aspect because this is something that provides a lot of value. And this is a report that we give to the board every single meeting. And that is we will take a risk and let's say, um, say it's, you know, um, flood. And then we can track flood. We can apply mitigating controls and then we can assess those controls on a regular basis, depending on whatever often we want to set it. If we want to do six months or annually, et cetera. And in vendor will tell us when it's time to assess that control. We're not having to go look at a spreadsheet or, or some other system and say, okay, is it time to assess the mitigating controls for our flood risk? We get an email saying it's time to assess these controls. I click on the email and it takes me right into the system, right to where I'm supposed to go. And I can assess the risk with just points and clicks of the button. And then I'm done. Right. And now that the, those mitigating controls for that risk of flood have been reassessed for, let's say it's annually on an annual basis. Now, the financial aspect of it and what we can provide to the board is that we can take all of our risks and we can give to the board, and it's not a perfect methodology, mm -hmm. but it gives them a ballpark estimate of what is the financial impact to Fork Bank for each of these risks that we expect would happen. What we found from doing this and setting this up and developing and configuring it for the first time um, years ago, was that risks that we thought it's off the top of our head would be a huge financial impact to Fork Bank. After we applied the mitigating controls to it and we applied a dollar amount, we come to find out that really it's not that much of a financial risk to our balance sheet if that risk happened. Right. And then the opposite held true too. Things that we were not expecting to be much of a financial impact turned out to be significant financial impact. And when we saw that, then that allowed us to go back and say, ooh, we need to add some more controls to this. We need to figure out some better ways to control this risk because we're not doing a good job at it. The financial impact is too great. And so I'll use tornado as a quick example. Off the top of our head, we developed a scenario. The risk was a tornado um, hit a branch and completely destroyed it. Okay, Just off the top of our head, we're thinking that's going to be a huge financial impact to rebuild this branch and Etc. And again, I'm. I do want to let the audience know I'm focusing strictly on financial risk here. I'm not talking about reputation risk or operational risk, etc. Strictly from a financial impact to the balance sheet. So we're thinking this is going to be a huge impact to us. By the time we applied our mitigating controls, it came out to be almost zero. It was a nominal financial risk to the bank. The main reason being is that we have insurance. So yes, that if it costs two million dollars to rebuild this branch insurance is going to cover it. Our real financial loss is mainly the deductible for the insurance policy. Yeah. And then some ancillary things that insurance doesn't cover. So 
in that example, what we thought was going to be a huge financial risk really turned out not to be. The opposite held true in the example I gave was with insider threats. So if we had, say, a disgruntled employee, which is a this is what we track this as a risk. We have a disgruntled employee who um, does something to our internal systems to harm them before they leave. So let's say they inject a computer virus or whatever scenario we're going to use. Initially, we were thinking, well, no, there's not much damage they could do because of the limited um, uh, information they can obtain or harm or hurt and things like that. That is true for most people within the bank. But when we got a little bit more granular with the controls and with the risk, and we started looking at insider threat from a system administrator perspective, then we realized, wait a minute, if a system administrator or one of my IT um, admins became disgruntled and wanted to do harm, with the level of elevated privileges they have with various systems as well as the infrastructure itself, they could do large amounts of harm. So we started thinking, how can we monitor this? How can we track this? What can we, what other new controls can we put in place? So it's in risk has really, from a, a risk management perspective, has shed a light on areas we need to improve on. Right. Um, and, and, and something that we talked about our, earlier, I want to briefly discuss too. We talked about the time management piece. Within risk, I can focus on risks that are truly a high risk to fork bank. Right. I have limited resources, limited time. With end risk, I can look at the end report, which is pretty long that we provided the board, and I can say, here are the top five risks that, from a financial perspective that we are concerned about, and this is what we're doing to fix it. You know, uh, Chip, you really touched on a key salient point uh, of our risk product. And I think, again, it, it's one of our stronger products that we have. As, as a risk practitioner, I think risk is like a good wine. It gets better with age. Uh, and I look at that in terms of risk. Once you start asking questions and documenting those, you're going to have more questions. And so it's not trying to build the perfect risk system directly out of the box. But as you start asking questions, and like you were talking about these controls and assessing these risks, you start asking more and more. Uh, and it helps to kind of build out any of those controls that you're using. It does. Uh, and and it, we call it our maturity level. When we originally implemented in risk, we had cyber threat as one risk. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an all-encompassing. So it could have been email phishing. It could have been man-in-the-middle attack, et cetera. As we've evolved, we have broken cyber security or cyber threats out into individual threats, such as email phishing. So that way we could start to focus what controls do we have in place to specifically mitigate email phishing. And so to come up to your point, as we've evolved and matured or as new threats have entered, we've broken them down and gotten more granular so we can see where we have weaknesses. So Chip, in, in the, just the next you know five minutes, and I just want to wrap this up so we don't uh, belabor the point, but one of the issues that you and I talked about the other day, and I think it, it's key, you've done, and you're part of your institution, some acquisitions. You've been on the team that's looking uh, at you know acquiring bank. What have you seen with those banks that really don't have any processes or systems? And, and you know how does that impact the valuation when, when, you know, from your experience? Sure. In, in my former life, too, another bank that I work at, um, specifically, I was on an M&A team um, that we acquired um, a billion asset bank. And we also acquired a half a billion asset bank outside of Kentucky. And one of the things that we my teams conducted over 30 um, acquisition due diligence targets. So for about a two year period, we were constantly kind of running around the United States looking at um, banks. All these banks, 99% of them were um, failed institutions that were being taken over by the OCC or FDIC. When we went into these banks, one of the aspects that my team was responsible for gauging and judging and, and reviewing was the IT infrastructure, the risk mitigation controls, um, enterprise risk management, vendor management, and so forth like that, as well as systems and servicing and loan operations, et cetera. When we went in, if we could see or we couldn't ascertain how strong their 
their risk management programs were or their vendor programs were, then we were automatically starting to reduce our bid design right out the gate. Um, if, if you don't know where the bodies are buried, it's hard to give a, a fair to, and accurate um, representation and bid to the board. Right. So, you know, I think within contracts, if someone came in, just like an auditor does, and looks at our bank, we can clearly show where our strengths and weaknesses are. We can clearly show the level of documentation and detail of our procedures and our policies, um, our reporting, and our reporting to the board as well as various committees, risk committee and, and IT committee. Well, Chip, uh, you know, certainly thank you on that. And, uh, you know, I think, again, you really touched on some salient points that, you know, end contracts, you know, offers and provides the efficiency, which you have noticed yourself in terms of doing more with less and helping to document those processes and systems in risk and vendor business continuity and following up on issues within findings. You've got key aspects of it there. You've also talked about, you know, uh, and given us examples of the knowledge as a service we talk about here in end contracts and how that's implemented by providing that constant service, not just selling a product and moving on, but the support that we provide for to it. And also not what I call nickel and diming for every little change or storage of a document or review of a document. When, you know, when we review something, we review it in its whole. Um, and so we, you've talked about just a lot of great features with us, and I appreciate you taking your time. Selena, is there any other last questions you want to take for now, or do we want to schedule a, a second part to this? <laughs> yes, I know. What great information. Thank yeah. you both so much for the content for today's podcast. And Raphael, tell our audience what is the best way for them to get in contact with you if they want to take a look at all those in solutions that you bring to the table. Well, again, for your members, Selena, you you and I have worked well together while I was at the OCC and, and here. So if they, you know, bring questions to you and know how to reach you. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me at Rafael Delion. Uh, and along within contracts, I put a lot of information out there in terms of my viewpoint of the industry and what's happening and commenting on articles. So they can follow up through you or with me directly, and I can help address any questions. And I really, as you can tell, very passionate about this, enjoy yeah. talking about our products and solutions. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Chip. Thank you so much for your time today. And audience, please know there is additional information on KBA's website for in contracts as well. And you can go to K kybanks.com to find that information. But that's all for this episode of Vendor Viewpoint. Until next time, this podcast is a wrap. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.